So you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. When we came to Christ, and we were born again spiritually, did we get up? Or are we, are we sitting back down? Did we pick up our mat? Well, why would Jesus tell this man, pick up your mat? I, I mean, the guy didn't need the mat anymore, correct? It's your testimony. You, you see, 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 I can see this man taking this mat, and, and, and I could see him jumping up and down because now he could move. His nerves were working now. His muscles were working. His organs were working. He could move around. And I could see him carrying this old bedridden, stinking mat. But you know what? I bet that man kept that mat for the rest of his life. I bet he had that mat right there in his home. He might have kept it out in the yard sometimes so he could point to it when somebody came by. Hey, look, look, that's, I want to tell you about what that is. I want to tell you about what Jesus brought me up out of. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2. And we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 12, a little passage there. Pull out some uh, focal verses from that in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to go ahead and read that for you. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, when Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at the home. And many people were gathered so that there was no longer any room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, go home. And he got up immediately, picked up the mat, and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Wow. Wow. You know, you know, when we read the Word of God, we're reading a historical event that actually took place right here on planet Earth. I mean, does it ever really cross your mind that God in the flesh walked on this planet that he created? And so I love these, I love these historical uh, stories that, that give us a little glimpse and, and I love, I love what, what God's really trying to teach us through these passages about himself. And, and what's really cool about it is he's not only trying to teach us about himself, he's trying to teach us something about us. And, and you know, so we, we go back, we're going to pull out some focal verses, as I said, and we go back to verse 2. And, and notice that Jesus had, had come back to Capernaum. 
He, he had been out healing. If you remember the passage, the chapter before this, he had healed a leper and he told the leper, hey, look, don't go tell anybody. But well, what did the leper do? He, he went and told. And so the word spread. And so people started, Jesus couldn't, he had to, he had to go out into an area where there weren't a lot of people. Of course, people followed him and gathered around him. And so that's where he is. He's, he's at this home, and many were gathered together. People had come in throngs, and there was no room around the house. It was just packed with people. Not even near the door. No one could even get to the door. And what was Jesus doing? Jesus was speaking the word of God. Now, now, there's one little side note I just want to mention to you. What, what, what is your home like? What is your home like? I mean, obviously, when God's power moves, people are drawn to him. We see that right here in this passage. Have you ever experienced God's power moving in your life? People are attracted when they, when they experience and see the power of God actually at work. And so what was Jesus doing? He was speaking the word of God. Well, what is your home like? Can, can people come to your home? Is, is your home a place where the word of God is alive? Where the word of God is spoken? Where the word of God lives and exists? Just, just a little side note, just a little question, a little check for myself, a little, little check for all of us. But I want you to look at verse 3, though, because, because this is where it gets really interesting because it says, they came bringing to Jesus a paralytic carried by four men. Now, remember, there, there's a crowd, so these four men are carrying this paralytic on a mat, one man on each corner carrying this, this paralytic. You know what a paralytic is? Someone whose central nervous system has become disabled. No longer, no longer are, are, are the impulses being transmitted to the spinal cord and the brain. No longer is the brain and the spinal cord transmitting impulses to the, to, to the muscles and the organs so that the man can function and do what he's supposed to do. He's paralyzed. And so here, here are these, these four men carrying this paralytic who can't carry himself. And, you know, spiritually speaking, who is the paralytic figurative of? Who is he figurative of? He, he's figurative of those people who, spiritually speaking, uh, have, have not become a part of the body of Christ. Spiritually speaking, uh, these people are, are people who, you know, as a body, we would function and, and, and operate together, correct? Have you ever heard of spiritual paralysis? Spiritual paralysis. Pe people who are, who are paralyzed spiritually because they're separated from God. So spiritually speaking, they can't function as a part of the body of Christ. And what are these four men doing? Who, who are these four men figurative of? These four men are figurative of you and me carrying people to Jesus, to his presence. You see, that's what we're supposed to be doing as the church but we're supposed to be bringing people into the presence of God. And that's what these four men were doing. I'm sure, I'm sure that this man had, had been told about Jesus. I'm sure that as we read on that he had some faith that was beginning to operate as he was being moved toward Jesus. Uh, as, as I was reading this, uh, these four men just, just really caught my attention because we don't know their names. We, we don't know who they were. And, and, and I thought about, um, have, have you ever read Pilgrim's Progress? John Bunyan? John Bunyan's 
Pilgrim's Progress. It was written way back in 1677. It's still in print today. Uh, they, they say that it's the very first uh, actual novel uh, allegory that was written in English. And, and so you understand what an allegory is, right? It's, it, it's, it's, it's a story that when it's interpreted, it reveals certain truths. Usually political allegories are written, moral allegories are written. And, and so as, as I was thinking about these men, uh, I thought about Pilgrim's Progress. I thought about that allegory. Because Pilgrim's Progress is a story, a Christian allegory, that, that is about a man who is in spiritual crisis. And he's been called to leave the city of destruction, the city of doom. And to venture out on a pilgrimage. So that he can progress in spiritual achievement. The, the main character, by the way, in the allegory, his name is Christian. And then you have some other characters. Evangelist is one of the characters. This is an allegory. Evangelist. Evangelist is one of the characters who brought the gospel to the main character, Christian. And then you have another character named Obstinate. Obstinate was actually Christian's neighbor, one of Christian's neighbors in the city of doom. And Obstinate just would not accompany Christian on the journey. Christian wanted Obstinate to, to accompany him. But Obstinate wouldn't do it. He wanted to stay right where he was. And then there was another character named Pliable. <laughs> Pliable actually did accompany Christian on his journey for a little while. For a little while. And then he fell into the slew of despond and he went back to the city of destruction and he was mocked by all of the townspeople because he didn't stay the course. He shouldn't have gone to begin with. And then we have uh, one character whose name is Help. Uh, Help actually pulled Christian out of the slew of despond. And you have another character named Worldly Wise Man. And Worldly Wise Man did everything he could to get Christian to give up on his foolish religious beliefs and become contented in a secular world. And then you had a formalist and hypocrisy. They were good buddies. Formalist and hypocrisy, they, they decided when they were at the wall of salvation that they would just climb over. They'd just climb on over instead of staying on the straight and narrow. And then you had uh, one more character. I, there's so many characters, but one more I'll mention is talkative. <laughs> talkative. You, you see, talkative and Christian got along for a little bit, but then Christian caught on to the fact that talkative was all you're interested in is just just spiritual words. You're not really interested in spiritual living. You're just talking. You're not walking it. It's, it's, a, it's a great story. And, and, and I hope that if you haven't read the book, you'll read it. A great story. But the reason I thought about that was because I, I, I was wondering, uh, what would these four men be called uh, in, in an allegory? There was actually a theologian who named these men if they had been in an allegory. I'm going to tell you what that is in just a minute, but let me ask you a question. Let me ask me a question. What would be, what would be your name if you were in a, an allegory? What, 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 what would be your name? What, what would you be called as a character in an allegory? What would I be called? based on who I am as a Christian, how I live my life, what would I really be called? I was talking with uh, my son last night. You know, he's about to be 15. I was talking with his mom, and we were talking on the phone about this subject. And I asked my son, what would you be called? And 
he, he, he really didn't, he couldn't come up with anything and he got out of the car and he went and did his own thing. You know, that's what kids do, right? But his mom said, well, I know we, we, would, we would call him teenager because that's, that's, that's what teenagers do. What would you be called? I mean, you know what? Some days you might be called one thing. Some days you might be called another, right? Some days you might be called faithful. Sometimes you might be called lazy, complacent. I don't know. I mean, I can't answer that for you. But I, I'll tell you what one theologian said, that these four men who were carrying this paralytic, well, what these four men would be called, if they were in an allegory, they would be called sympathy, cooperation, originality, and persistence. Now think about that for a minute. Sympathy. I mean, it takes sympathy to get somebody to Christ because for one thing, I have to perceive and understand their distress. Do we perceive and really understand the distress, the spiritual distress of someone who has not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? You know, sometimes they don't even realize their own distress. They don't, they don't even realize their own destiny. Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. That, that, that's part of what we're to do is we're to, we're to have a sympathy that Jesus has for those who are lost as the church. Cooperation. Well, one of those men would have been cooperation. That's another quality that we need to have as the church. Is that we need to cooperate as the body of Christ to get other people to Jesus. How are we doing in that area as a church? How are we doing? Are we cooperating? Do we have a plan to get other people to Christ? Originality. That, that's another one of the names of the men if they were in an allegory. Originality. I mean, we, we obviously see uh, that, that these men had to get kind of original when it came to getting this guy into the presence of Jesus, right? They, they, there were obstacles. How many of you have, have witnessed to someone and, and you ran into an obstacle and you just said, okay, well, I give up on that. I mean, you know, I've had the, I've had the privilege of you know, just simply sort of being led by the Spirit to walk up to somebody and say, hey, would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And they go, yeah, I, I really would. And it blew my mind, you know, because God had already sort of orchestrated that. But, you know, nine times out of ten, that's not how it works. You know, I can, I can, I can sit down and, and I can use the Romans road to salvation. I can do that. I could take my Bible and I could hit them over the head with it. I could do that. Uh, those, those things don't always work. A lot of times you have to get kind of original. You know, one of the things that I've done is uh, I've, I've, I've invited people in and, and shared movies with them. You know, have you ever seen the movie uh, Lee Strobel called A Case for Christ? You ever seen that movie? It is awesome, isn't it? I mean, it's a true story about a man who didn't want to believe in Jesus. His wife had become a Christian, and he hated that. And so he ventured out to, to disprove Christianity, and in the process, he was born again. It's a really great evangelical tool being original, coming up with, with different ways to get people into the presence of God. How are we doing it in that area? And, and persistence, not giving up, not giving up. Persistence. We see right here that in verse 4, all of these qualities are found in these men. Sympathy, cooperation, originality, persistence. Look at verse 4. Verse 4. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. 
And when they had dug an opening, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. They weren't going to let anything get in the way of getting this man to Jesus. We shouldn't give up so easily. I like verse 5. It says, And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. A couple things there, you know. He, 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 Jesus saw the faith of these four men. And then he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. You know, one of the things that tells me is that our faith <laughs> really does have an effect on people. It really does have an effect on the eternal destination of, of, of people. Our faith in getting them into the presence of Jesus. Another thing, second, is that, you know, Jesus says, hey, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say, uh, by the way, you're, you're healed. Jesus w was a little more concerned about this man's eternal condition. Not, not so much his temporal, physical condition. Jesus sees the eternal condition. And we as a church should always try to, to use Christ's eyes when it comes to leading people to him. Have a, have a greater concern for their eternal condition. Now, now understand that, that Jesus didn't stop there. We see the religious legalists getting involved in verses 6 through 11. And, and by the way, these are scribes. Scribes, people who, who definitely should have recognized Christ for who he was. Scribes, they, they, their role well, was to copy. They didn't have copy machines. They didn't have copy machines. They didn't have printing presses. The scribes had to copy the manuscripts to preserve them. That means, you know, to me, that means they, they read them a lot. You would think that they would have been the ones who recognized Christ for who he was. But we see right here, let me just read verses 6 through 11. Some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? <laughs> I mean, right there. Uh, you, you know, right there is the answer. Right there is the deity of Jesus Christ forgiving sins. Immediately, Jesus. Now, remember, these guys were just reasoning in their hearts. They weren't saying anything. And Jesus, immediately aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Man, that would have gotten my attention right there. That would have gotten my attention. Jesus knew what I was thinking. This man knew what I was thinking. I didn't even say it. Why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Yeah, anybody could say that, right? Your sins are forgiven. How did they know they were really forgiven? Anybody could say it. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus goes on to say, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or hey, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. I mean, here, here's a paralyzed man. Here's a man who has been probably on this mat for who knows how long. Who knows how many years. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or get up, pick up your mat, and, and walk? Obviously, obviously in verse 10, Jesus says, but so you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. There's an order of operation here, spiritually speaking. Get up, pick up your mat, and go home. Get up, 
pick up your mat, go. You know, when we lead people to Christ, when we came to Christ, and we were born again spiritually, did we get up? Are we, are we sitting back down? Did we pick up our mat? What mat? Well, why would Jesus tell this man, pick up your mat? I mean, the guy didn't need the mat anymore, correct? Pick, pick up your mat. Take, take your mat. Have you, have you realized what your mat is? It's your testimony. You, you see, 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 I can see this man taking this mat and, and, and I could see him jumping up and down because now he could move. His nerves were working now. His muscles were working. His organs were working. He could move around. And I could see him carrying this old bedridden, stinking mat. Who would want a bedridden, stinking mat? I could see him carrying it. And I could see him going. Get up. Take your mat. Go. Go forth. Take your mat. My, my mat stinks too. But you know what? I bet that man kept that mat for the rest of his life. I, I bet he had that mat right there in his home. He might have kept it out in the yard sometimes so he could point to it when somebody came by. Hey, look, look, that's, I want to tell you about what that is. I want to tell you about what Jesus brought me up out of. Are you carrying your mat? No, we all have one. Some of us just want to put it in the closet. Some of us want to throw it away. We, we don't want to ever see it again. We don't want to know anything about it. We act like it didn't happen. But God uses that mat. He uses that testimony. And look what happens. Look what happens when we, when we get up. When we take our mat and we go forward, look what happens in verse 12. And then we're going to close. I love this. He got up. He immediately picked up his mat. And he went out in the sight of everyone. I bet he walked right out that front door carrying that mat. He just walked right through that crowd. Carrying that mat. And look what it says. They were all amazed. Hey, listen, you, you, you might be surprised how many people are amazed when they see what God has done in your life. And look at what it says. It says, they glorified God. They glorified God, Paul. Saying, we've never seen anything like this. My challenge to, to, to us today as a church is somewhat twofold. My challenge is that we be a little more committed to bringing people into the presence of Jesus Christ. I challenge you with that today. You know, we, we, we may have to work on drawing a little closer to God so that, 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 that we, we tap back into that sympathy that we need to have for the lost. We might need to be a little more cooperative and come up with a plan maybe. Whether it's a small group or church. Or, let's get a plan together. We have to cooperate. Maybe we have to get a little original. We need to be persistent at it though. That's my challenge for me, for you, for us, as a church. And then, and then second, the challenge is get up. Don't hide your mat. 
Use it as God's led you to use it. And go forward. Thank you.